Welcome back to the table. Today, Ryan and I are going to give you a look at Stalker, yeah. the board game. I don't know if you have any experience with the video game. This is the tabletop representation of that. Uh, have you ever played Stalker, I the have, video game? I have, and this really nails the look, the feel, and just the, the plot and, and what you're doing in the game really nails it from the video game. Yeah, and even though the video game isn't a sort of tactical sort of game in its Well, yeah, it's a, it's a first-person survival game. They've translated that idea of, of being a first-person action game into a multiplayer board game. But a lot of what you're doing in the game as far as some of the decisions you're making as far as your survival goes as far as the way that you want to approach any given mission or scenario feels very in line with the things that you're doing in the video game. Yeah, but I, what I would say is, from a video game standpoint, the gameplay itself feels more like one of those tactical games like an XCOM. Sure. Or if you're familiar with back in the day games like Jagged Alliance like that, where you're moving miniatures around a map, trying to be stealthy, using your equipment, that sort of thing. And I will say this, after our one little bit of an experience with this prototype, I feel like this recreates that sort of, sort of experience as well as any that I've oh, ever played sure. at the table. And, and we'll talk about that as we get into the video, but that, that tactical system and that sense of cooperation and like I said, that multi-pronged approach to how to uh, conquer a particular mission really comes through with the action system. And that is something that we want to talk about. We don't always go deep into a game uh, talking about how to play it, and we won't really because there no. is so much, but that is one thing we want to talk about. But before you even get to a scenario, before you even start with the actions, you're going to go through a campaign normally. Now, there is a box you can get that just lets you play like one-off scenarios. Yeah, that is part of, I think, what they're offering is a one-off scenario thing. But I think the game is meant, first and foremost, to be a campaign experience. Yeah. And that not only starts from like 30,000 feet, but even when you're playing a given scenario, these things really unfold in an incredibly narrative way. Yeah, and it's very interesting. You literally start the game with just one little book. This is just Stalker's Memento. This is the story of the game. And what's neat here, there is a little bit of a narrative framing. You are an old stalker telling stories around the campfire about your stalker days. And that kind of narrative lets them do some kind of fun things yeah. as, as you play through in the terms game. Of the, in terms of the mechanics of like if you lose and you have to replay, it kind of frames that yeah. in a way that's kind of cute. Uh, so you're going to start just with this book. Now, at the beginning of the game, you only really have one thing to do. You've played the first mission, you flip to the first page. That first page is going to tell you kind of the story that's happening. It's going to help you set up your stalker. Each player is going to take on the role of an individual unique stalker. You're going to grab your player board and things like that. It's going to direct you to open up a specific box which is going to have setup instructions and some special things like that. Um, but for future scenarios, you're going to start getting some options. There are a few things that I want to talk about that are going to be done in between scenarios that are just neat. For one thing, there's this giant binder, which is going to be filled with crew that you encounter. It's going to be filled with cards that you discover that are going to go into your village. Yeah, it's like your stash and your, your stash. it represents your village. So this is kind of like your base that you go back to in between missions. and we, a, we don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, no, B, not at all. we don't know yeah, how it's going to unfold, but we're assuming, based on our experience in the first mission which here, which is what we have for the that you're going to be yeah. able to do things like heal up because we took a beating yeah. in the first mission. We did survive, yeah. uh, but there's going to be a lot of things you do and there. Yeah, there's a whole phase, and, there, and this is kind of feels like Ice as Vanguard, which was also from yes. Wicked Realms, where, you, where this keeps track of everything, also helps you save your state if you're playing through a campaign. And the other cool thing is that there's a map. Um, and this is like a hand, it almost looks like a hand-drawn stalker map. Like they're just drawn on it, marking things. As you discover them, you'll be taking stickers and adding them to this map, which is cool. Yeah, this has a lot of locations, again, a lot of which we don't really recognize. I do see one spot here that looks representative of the mission we played. And at the end of what we did, we were instructed, and we didn't put it on here, so we don't there are spoil no anything. spoilers on this map right now, to put a sticker on here. And from what it seems like, there's going to be points at which where you can say, hey, let's go here or let's go here. Yeah. You're going to be able to look at that map and see all your available missions. Like I said, each mission is linked to one of these little boxes. So you'll choose your mission, you'll find your little box. It's also worth noting that there's going to be some story stuff on that map too. You might add a sticker and go, oh, this says read this card. Yeah. And you go get that card and it reads something and gives you some more narrative or maybe some choices to make. But the core of the game is playing through these scenarios. And these scenarios are made up like you see here with a variety of different things. It's going to tell you how to arrange these boards. It's going to tell you where to place the enemies, which enemy cards to use over on the side, 
which anomalies you might encounter, which is something that's kind of thematic to the Stalker universe, yes, which is sure. they get their own cards. It's going to tell you how to set up the scenario with your character's items, maybe some special rules cards that are in play, and a deck of cards that is unique to that scenario that you don't get to know. You have to find them as you go and uncover these cards, which are going to add new twists and turns to the scenario. And then the last thing is these overlay cards, which might be kind of hard to see, but there are a number of overlay cards that are set on top of this map to kind of blend in. And these are going to be changing as you go through the game as well, giving you some secrets and some narrative to uncover as you play. Yeah, and those also serve as points of interest, really, because you see the card there, and the game wants you to know there's something to investigate, something yeah. to potentially look for there. And it does do that. It drives you along. Not to mention, as you go through this book, there may be things in here that add more cards to the board. It may better define a location and what's going on there, giving you a little bit more motivation to go and investigate it. And that's one of the things I really wanted to point out. This game has a lot of rich flavor, and it really feels, we were trying to think of the best word, yeah. dynamic is the word I would use, because this is not just a this game system, and here's the scenario, move around, here's how the enemies are gonna act, here's how you're gonna act, do that until you get to the right. end, and here's what triggers the end. This thing feels like it's evolving as you play it based on you know, looking in the window, seeing what's in a room, all this sort of stuff. And I, that's just this first scenario. I'm very curious to yeah. see how that plays out. And speaking of that game system, it is a robust game system. I, mean, I do want to point this out. Anyone who's into a game like this in the first place, I think, is going to be on board for a fairly robust yeah, rule system. Yeah, it really is. You're going to have to read a rule book. You're going to have to learn this. No one's going to be able to put this on the table without reading the rules sure. and start playing. With that said, once you get a handle on this action point system, or not action point system, but these action, action token tokens system, yeah. it really is a very easy system to pick up because it all stems from that. Yeah, and that, that really is. It's, it's very easy to teach as long as you know the rules and you kind of know how interactions work. You can teach the game very simply to people because you have three action tokens in front of you. You have what's called a long action token and two short action tokens. Everywhere in front of you, you're going to see those symbols. You might see a long action symbol, a short action symbol, a free action symbol, which you don't need to use a token right. for, and then sometimes instant action symbols that just happen automatically. Wherever you see these action symbols, it's showing you that you can take an action. A lot of that is gonna come from your player board, which is called a PDA, and all the different cards that are on that, that player board, but it can expand out from that. Yeah, I mean, like we said, it starts with your character. My character, Borsuk, has a move, another move that's called keeping low, and then a prepare action. And one of the, two of those are short actions, yeah. one of them is a long action. Then you're gonna look to your items, your weapons, all of those too have short and or long, maybe even some free yep. actions that you can use on your turn. As you do this, you're going to flip over that token. So if I want to take the keeping low move action, I can move a little further. It's going to increase my defense because, you know, I'm keeping low. And then I flip over my long action token. Now, all the different characters have different long and short action tokens. Mine yep. have a special ability. Whenever you do this, you're going to move one in addition to whatever you did. So if I move two, I'm yeah. going to move one with this long action token. But I also get to re-roll my die if that results in something where I have to roll die. Right? Yeah. So like if I'm using a weapon, I'm going to be rolling die to see if I hit. If I use my long action token to do so, I'll get a re-roll out of that. Where Ryan got defensive I die did. so that when he's moving around, if someone takes opportunistic fire, he's got a little extra defense. Yeah, and these actions that you're taking, like we do, you do have to look for them, but it, it's just neat how they come out. Yeah. Because you're not limited to just taking actions on your player board. Those cards we talked about have actions printed on them. Sometimes when you flip them to the back, they'll have actions printed. You might have some rules cards. The scenario might say, set some rules cards aside. Those rules might have actions printed on them. There will be these anomalies which come onto the board which have actions printed on them. And then there's that campaign book Every round of the campaign is going to have you turn the page to a new page of the story. You don't necessarily know what's going to happen from round to round. Things might happen. In fact, in this starting scenario that we played, there were some explosions, there were some loud noises, there was some maybe interference from some things that happened. You don't know. So every time you flip the page, it's going to give you some special rules, but it might also give you some special actions to take 
as well. Again, you're only getting three actions a turn, but the things that you can do with those actions grow and grow and grow as you explore the game. Right, and Ryan just mentioned noise, and I think that's the other aspect that I'd want to focus on here. Now, you've probably seen noise in a number of other games. You've seen it in things like Zombicide. I think, and I don't play a lot of those games. Sure. Maybe correct I've me if I'm wrong. I've played quite a few of these games. But the noise in this is used in a very tactical manner, for sure, because I can make a bunch of noise, yeah. and you'd think, oh, well, that's bad. And it can be, because everyone's going to, within that noise radius, effectively, potentially come and investigate. But if I can do that and manage it such that they move a little towards me and then maybe I hide yeah. somewhere where I'm out of their sight, I've distracted them so then Ryan can stealthily move around. And there was some of that that we did in our session. Ryan was the noisemaker at first and I, I have a sniper rifle. I was kind of trying to set up, be quiet, take some people out. And you really could do yeah. this. And then things went awry. I found a different sort of rifle that could Stop do lots of damage. Of I picked it up and did a ton of damage. And then poof, I threw a smoke grenade down. We were able to affect line of sight, so we were able to navigate around that. But that was a really interesting puzzle that sort of unfolded in how to manage the enemies around the board. Yeah, I think that's a key part. You said the word puzzle, and that really does feel thematic to Stalker as well, because every time you're approaching a scenario, you're like, well, do I want to fight my way through this? Yeah. Oh, there's a window over there. Can I get to that window? And because you can use your actions in any order, I could take an action, David could take an action. I have an action that lets David move an extra space. David has a smoke grenade that can cause a distraction and let me sneak by. So you can coordinate with people at the table to use your actions in a very smart way that allows you to avoid combat. Or maybe you just want to run head in and fight. And I really like, I, I've seen games that have said that you can do either. This game, you really can do either. And I think that noise system is so interesting. And again, they did, this is a sponsored video, so I don't like to go yeah. on and on, but I do really think that this is something interesting that I think you're gonna find interesting as well. Because as you do these actions, as you fire, as you throw things, as you just make noise and run around, you're adding either red or yellow tokens to a space, and you're going to add all that together. Red tokens are two, yellow tokens are one, and you're gonna get a total value of noise. That is the range at which people can hear it. And this is very interesting because if you have a range of four, you're gonna look and see, will enemies within four, will they respond to this? If they're farther than four, they're just gonna go around their, their you know, regular business. You might have a cluster of noise over here and a cluster of noise over here and the, the guards are gonna be moving in different ways. Plus you have these tokens inside these rooms. These represent guards that are inside buildings. Potentially. 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 If enough noise is happening outside, you'll flip over one of these tokens and it might be a guard that goes, oh, I heard something, I'm gonna come out and investigate. So you can get in, a, in real trouble if you're making too much noise, everyone's coming f towards you, but maybe you want that while the other two players are maybe, or three players or however many are sneaking around the back way to complete the objective. And that feels, it just feels very good and it's really well done. Um, especially when the when you talk about like this uh, flowchart card. Yeah, the flowchart with the enemies when they activate is really interesting and also very easy to follow. That's yeah. one of the things that I think a lot of people who are maybe newer to these games find intimidating is, oh, I have to run through how all the enemies behave. You just follow this for each enemy and it's very simple. You just go through this. It's a pretty short flowchart yeah. as flowcharts go. The other cool thing about enemies in general and the other thing I think I'd want to focus on with the combat that goes on here are there are other factions that are not necessarily allies of your other enemies. Yeah, that's true. So you can have some other things. We don't want to spoil anything, but there's some other things that can sort of unfold. Uh, but just to give you an idea, midway through a mission, some other things might and show some up. some monsters pop in possibly. And, and the monsters don't care who they attack. They might attack the other people that you're against, the bandits, or they might attack you. But you can also kind of puzzle that out too creating noise, kind of bringing those two together so yeah, that during their activation, you've got a little help action. Right, it's, it's, very, it's very smart. And the fact that, yeah, when, it, when you're looking at this, this algorithm or whatever they call it, it just says, if there's an enemy of, in line of sight, they're gonna go for that first. So if you can trick a monster into being in line of sight of one of these bandits, the bandit is just gonna start shooting at that monster. <laughs> and vice versa. And another great thing about combat, or cool thing about combat is they're not rolling dice. The enemies are not rolling dice. You're always rolling dice. When they want to hit you, you're rolling defense dice. When you want to hit them, you're rolling attack dice. And there's a lot more to this system. You can target special body parts. You can yeah. you know, try to go for the headshot for instant kill. You can go for a body shot, maybe do a little damage. When you're defending, you're trying to bring their defense down and there's a lot of items and things that can maybe let you roll more dice or add to that ability. Um, but you're really trying not to take wounds. 
which, you know, could end up, you could end up dying pretty easily in this game if you just run headfirst into combat, which would be bad. Yeah, and when we say wounds, we mean wounds. Yeah. We don't mean hit points. There's nothing in this game that we've seen thus far no. that represents like, I have this much health, I'm going to lose that health. You have a space across the bottom of your board for three wounds. And you can take wounds from combat like that. You can also take radiation wounds. They fill these yeah, spots. Which is this cool little Geiger counter. If you've ever played Stalker or know anything about it, radiation is a big part of the game. And just even in our first mission, our radiation levels went up pretty high. Oh, for sure. There does promise to be some things to do to mitigate that, <laughs> to bring it down. I actually had some vodka that helps yeah, me manage go. that a little bit. But once those are filled up, and this is one of the kind of things that I like about games of this ilk, is you get to a point where if you take another wound, you could die. Yeah. You don't die, you might die, and it leaves it up to chance, which I don't mind when it comes to the point where the, re the, the alternative is, well, we could have made the game system to where you take another wound, you're dead. Right. You lose. They give a, you get a little bit of risk there. You get a glimmer, a a glimmer of hope. And I, the way this first mission ran out, we were, we, we'd done what we needed to do without any spoilers. We were trying to make it our way to the exit, so to speak. I got out by the skin of my teeth. I mean, I have three wounds. So did and I. I, I actually rolled once for my fourth and survived. Ryan rolled a few times and survived. But it was really, it was rough. you know, that's a fun, I always like that because it's like, you've always got a chance. When, and it's basically one of those chances where there's only upside. The downside is you could have died a long time ago, well, but you didn't. And the thing is, you don't know what's going to happen. And this is the last thing I want to stress with this game, is that you never know what's going to happen. You have, for example, these anomalies on the board, which you can go investigate, which might lead you to rare artifacts, or it might have you draw a card and something terrible happens. But it'll likely give you radiation. It'll FYI. probably give you radiation. <laughs> Every time you investigate one of these things, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't even necessarily know what your objective is. We had an objective to rescue someone. That's it. Okay, what does that mean? Well, then as we started to flip this book, it started saying, well, here's, you're starting to uncover more of what's going on here. You're starting to see some things. Some other people are starting to come and mess with that. Eventually, maybe you can rescue them and then it gives you a new goal. So there's a lot of, of times you don't really know exactly what you're doing. It's not like it says, put the figure out there, get to the figure and bring him home. You don't even know. We didn't even know where our, you know, our, our evacuation was supposed to be or how we were supposed to right. handle that. And even if you die, it tells you to go to a special page in the book and it might say, hey, you lucked out this time or did you at least find this card? If you found this card, then you're good. But if you didn't, let's go back and do it again. Right. So you really don't know. And I think that's a very interesting part of the game that really does you know, Im influence the narrative for sure. Yeah, and lastly, of course, this is an Awakened Realms game. So uh, there's various levels, I'm sure, to their campaign sure. on GameFound. But what the prototype has here that we have, and keep in mind this is a prototype, they have the same beautiful figures that they always do. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, we didn't yeah. see this guy in our play, but I'll hold this up. I don't know if you can see that. It's just the same sort of thing that you'd expect from Awakened Realms. Uh, yeah, the whole which... presentation is great. And we'll put some photos up. We're not using the 3D elements to the board because right. it would really obstruct your ability to see what we were talking about. But you can actually have a 3D upgrade to put actual buildings on this board and see where all the entrances are instead of them just being printed eyeballs on the board. You actually can have windows and doors and things on those buildings, which is just another cool touch that really leans into the thematic nature of the game. For sure. So that is Stalker, the board game. This is the next one from Awaken Realms. If you have any questions at all about it, please make them in the comments below. We'll get down there, answer anything we can based on what we know about the game. And until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table and we'll see you then. Bye.